Hey guys, what's up? It's Dark Mech here and welcome back to another video. Today, I am giving you my rundown of BlizzCon 2017 for all things World of Warcraft. So if you didn't get the virtual ticket, you haven't read MMO Champ, you haven't been watching the videos that would no doubt be on YouTube by now and all that kind of stuff, uh, I am going to give you the full coverage for what went on with the World of Warcraft and I'm going to give you my two cents as well because that's the whole point of being a content creator is that you're an over-opinionated asshole. Uh, so, what I'm going to cover off today, uh, I'm going to be going over the new expansion, obviously, that was announced, World of Warcraft Battle for Azeroth. I'm going to be talking about the announcement for World of Warcraft Classic Servers, but I'm going to talk about this right at the end of the video because it's an extremely loaded topic. I'm going to be talking about the allied races or the sub races that came in, uh, the new social systems, the changes to the leveling system we're going to see, the patch 7.3.5, uh, Ultra Time Walking, the new Battleground that's coming in, the raid buffs that are coming back, the stat squish, the item level squish, the future of Titan Forging, Legendaries, Mythic Pluses, and a few other little gems. So I'll try and put timestamps in the description as well if you just want to skip to one area in particular. So let's get started guys, and I'm obviously going to start at the most obvious starting point, which is of course the new expansion, the Battle for Azeroth. Uh, so you would have of course seen the new cinematic by now, unless you've been living under a rock, which was unveiled at BlizzCon. Uh, and straight off the bat, aside from being as Blizzard always is, absolutely amazing in regards to a cinematic, it really drives the theme of what this expansion is setting up to be, which is just Grassroots Alliance v Horde. Two faction leaders are in the video, Sylvanas and Manduin. It is a giant war. Uh, they're leading their forces against one another. We're continuing on from that broken shore conflict, and it's all kind of coming to another steamroll again. And the video, or the cinematic, certainly did a fantastic job, job at setting up that theme. And my first impressions from watching the video was I was absolutely blown away, especially when Sylvanas went Super Saiyan, when Manduin was all man-like, he's got a fucking lion helmet on, you know, he was Buddy Jesus, it was really good, you know, it did the job. After, you know, a couple of minutes after watching it and I was sitting there, some concerns actually started to hit me and I don't mean for that to be negative in any way. Keep in mind, these are my initial thoughts. It's obviously really early days in regards to what we're seeing, and this cinematic is only setting that up. My thought, though, my worry, is I'm not sure that Alliance v Horde is enough to fill an entire expansion. You know, over the last few expansions, we have always had a decentralized baddie sort of set up from the get-go that we're going against. You know, this, on the other hand, is Alliance v Horde. Um, it's, it kind of feels like after watching the cinematic and, and sitting through BlizzCon that it's like a PvP expansion set up in a PvE format. Um, now obviously it's a super quick judgement. I know we're gonna uh, be off and we're gonna fight Queen Ajara, so there's obviously go- and there's, of course there's going to be raid encounters. Um, but they're just not outlined from the get-go. So that was my initial thought, you know, and, and after three or so expansions of fighting you know, side by side against the forces of evil, we're going to just start punching on again. And I know, again, that continues from the Broken Shore, but it just sort of seems like, uh, okay, this is where we're going. As I said, though, it's early days. There's still a lot of talk about the old gods making an appearance uh, towards the end of uh, the Battle for Azeroth. You know, the planet's dying. We've, we've just sort of uh, finished with the Titans, but the first raid that's set up is at uh, Old Titan uh, Quarantine Facility. So there's certainly a lot of buzz about the old gods making an appearance towards the end of Battle for Azeroth, and maybe that'll really kick it on as well. So moving away from the actual cinematic and into the actual expansion itself, the Battle for Lordaeron is going to kick off the expansion. So the Horde burned down uh, Tedrasel or Tel Dressel, that's how you say it, uh, and we attack Lordaeron. We have no idea who started the fire. Nice one, Billy Joe. Uh, but we, you know, we're going to find out as we play through as to who started that. The Alliance have control over the majority of the Eastern Kingdoms, and the Horde control Kalimdor. So that's pretty much the setup for what we're going to be going into the battle for Azeroth with. We go off and make new friends. So for the Alliance, our new allies are the Kul'Tiras, uh, and for the Horde, the Zandalar. 
Uh, the Col Terrace, the Alliance Continent, has three new zones. So Tiergard Sound, which is the Alliance Hub, Drusfar, and Stormstrong Valley. And Zandalar, the Horde Continent, has three zones. Uh, Zuldazar, which is the new Horde Hub, Nazmir, and Volden. So the new allies have the largest navy fleet and it's just a coincidence that we're separated, separated by the Great Sea and we're going to use those ships to set out to war. There will be six new zones over the two continents. Uh, you'll basically level up to 120 in your own faction zone and then the rest of the world will open up to you at level 120. We're going to see emissaries and world quests are back. They will uh, kick into game from level 120 as well. Blizzard said they felt they'd been a great success uh, and there was no reason not to carry them through into battle for Azeroth and I couldn't agree with that more. I think world, quest, uh, world quests were a fantastic way to get people out into the world uh, at the start of the experience expansion especially uh, and they carry that importance at the start and then you can choose to neglect them later on when you don't really need to be doing them every day. Uh, the zones will be the same setup for leveling as we saw in Legion with the scaling. This again is a huge bonus in regards to the choice and being able to move around and play with your friends. Uh, further to this, they're going to be ingrating, integrating this kind of leveling system throughout the entirety of Azeroth and Co. So uh, they're going to set up a similar system for each expansion and we can actually expect to see some of this in 7.3.5. So the way this is going to look is the zones will have level ranges with caps, which will grant flexibility in regards to your expansion playthrough. Uh, so Outlands is going to scale from 60 to 80. Northrend is going to scale from 60 to 80. And this will also apply for dungeons and raids. So that is going to be really cool as well. What about our artifact weapons? Well, our artifact weapons will not be coming with us into Battle for Azeroth. They will get apparently an appropriate send-off. Instead, we're going to be getting a neck piece called the Heart of Azeroth, which instead of feeding off AP, artifact power, like our weapons, it'll feed off AP, Azerite power. Shit. Uh, so basically, this will be a power-up source as you progress, uh, which will unlock different traits and boosts as you go. So at the moment, the, uh, the amulet, the Heart of Azeroth, is tied to three pieces of armor that will function via the neck, the helm, chest, and shoulders, uh, it appears at the moment. And basically, it's going to replace the entirety of the legendary system we saw in Legion. So legendary Legion uh, is not coming through with us. It has all been replaced by the neck. And the traits that you get as you power up uh, your neck through your armor, they are going to be like the boosted effects you got from legendaries in Legion. Uh, there's going to be rings that you're going to work through from the outside towards the middle of your amulet. The closer you get to the middle of those traits, the more Azerite power you're going to need to empower that trait. Uh, new armor will bring new traits with it, but the same piece of armor will always have the same traits. And what I mean by that is if you get a tier helm in normal, heroic, or mythic raid difficulty, it's all going to have the same traits. You're obviously going to want the highest item level one all the time, but it's all going to have the same traits. So that's, that's what's replacing legendaries. And, and I'm quite excited about that. That, you know, that actually looks all right. It looks a lot more friendlier than artifact weapons as well, because the amulet's going to work across specs rather than where we were kind of, if you put all your AP into one weapon, your other weapons got left behind here, obviously. Uh, and I like it. I like the neck idea. I, don't get me wrong, I'm probably one of the few people, actually I think there's quite a lot now that AK is where it is, um, but I've really enjoyed the artifact weapon system. Uh, I really have. I fully understand that we definitely need something new moving into a new expansion, something fresh, but I've actually enjoyed not having to run a raid for my weapon. I've enjoyed having a fantastic weapon uh, all throughout the expansion that's just gotten stronger and stronger. Uh, but I guess in this case now I don't need to farm a neck, so it's still a positive. Um, Blizzard said, you know, they didn't like the AP grind that came through weapons. This, of course, is going to be another AP grind. It's just not artifact power. It's Azerite power, but it's a lot less cancerous than we saw with the weapon system. And I think they figured out a much better way to balance that. But time will tell. We're going to see the introduction of two new gameplay features in the battle for Azeroth. So we're going to see Warfronts. 
These are a homage to Warcraft 3 and its RTS roots. It's a 20 player co-op style raid against an NPC army. You are still playing in the same viewpoint uh, and things like that as you are in WoW, but you need to build structures, you need to upgrade buildings, you need to farm uh, timber, you need to mine ore, you need to recruit troops, and then you need to take your army to defeat the NPC army. The way that structures are going to be built is much the same as we've seen on the Broken Shore with the Mage Tower, the Nether Disruptor, and the Command Center. Uh, you'll go and do your things, you'll farm your resources, and then you'll be able to go back and contribute to the building that you want to be built. So they look really interesting. Again, there's going to be rewards associated with doing them. Uh, but again, that's something that's going to be offer, uh, offering different gameplay in the expansion. There's then going to be the Island Expeditions. So these are the return to the three player scenarios that we saw in Mr. Pandaria. Uh, they're role agnostic, so you can queue up as anything and they feel that they can cater the groups to anything. The islands have a lot of different combinations. I think there was four different combinations for each uh, setting on the island. I may be wrong on that, I can't remember. Don't get me wrong, you are eventually going to recall everything and know how everything should be done anyway, but for the first several playthroughs, it should have a different vibe to it every time you go in and give you that sense of dynamic gameplay. Uh, they refer to them as puzzle scenarios, so there are different ways to complete each objective uh, on the island, and there's different rewards for Azerite power associated on the island as well. There's small rewards and big rewards, and you need to make a decision as to what you go for. You will be versing the AI in three of the difficulties. There are four difficulties in total. There's normal, heroic, mythic, and PvP. Uh, and in the three difficulties of normal, heroic, and mythic, obviously, the AI will be racing for those same rewards, so you need to make choices. Depending on the level that you select in difficulty, the AI will become more and more cunning and more and more strategic. Mythic Sneaky Pete level will actually see the AI griefing you and causing you all types of issues, so that is going to offer a real challenge as well. If you decide to go down the PvP path, it'll see you duking it out with three actual players from an opposing faction in, ra in a race for those resources. So again, this is gonna offer a lot of fun as well. World PVP is changing. So in the Battle for Azeroth, in a nutshell, the whole world is being turned into a giant PVE server, and then you can opt into PVP. The bonus for doing this is they're going to be extra uh, rewards for having PVP turned on in the open world and completing things. What they are to this moment, I don't know, but that is something that is coming. Dungeons, we are going to see 10 new dungeons from launch, so each faction will have separate level up dungeons, with all dungeons becoming available at level 120. Mythic Plus is here to stay and will be even better again coming into Battle for Azeroth that they talked about, uh, being able to design dungeons specifically around Mythic Plus, uh, the dungeon adapting to what affixes are put in and things like that. So that is going to be really fucking cool to see in the Battle for Azeroth. We're also gonna see some social functions improved around Mythic Plus in regards to finding groups. So if you just wanna do a 10 key and you don't care what dungeon it is, you are going to be able to search for plus 10 keys and get the list of all that is available. So that will be awesome awesome as well. Raids, the first raid, much like Emerald Nightmare, is called uh, Old Deer Halls of Control. It's the Emerald Nightmare difficulty, kind of the introductory raid. Uh, it's going to have eight bosses. It was a Titan Quarantine facility. It's based around the Zandalar's corruption, and that looks really cool as well. Again, they only sort of had one sort of boss design uh, from that, and not a hell of a lot of other details. But, you know, I'm expecting big things as always. Blizzard have always really delivered with raid content in regards to visuals and bosses and things like that, I feel, so this will be nothing different. So some other goodies we are getting. So social features, there's new voice comms coming. So the Overwatch voice communication system is coming into WoW. When you join a dungeon, you will get the option to join into that voice chat. Uh, communities are a new thing. So. If you have a guild, none of that changes. But if you have a bunch of friends in different guilds that you say you run Mythic Pluses with, you can create a community to chat in uh, and you can be in multiple communities at once. There's also a text chat history. And what does all this sound like? It's fucking Discord. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I think it's cool, but it's Discord. And will people stop using Discord? I don't think so. Uh, but this is WoW's Discord. The predicted sub races came to be. So uh, allied races or sub races. So as I said at the start, 
we are getting allied races. Uh, so we're going to get three for the alliance and three for the horde. Uh, custom quest content is going to lead to recruiting those allied races into your faction, which will then become playable on your account upon the completion of the quest. Now, if you start an allied race off from scratch after unlocking them, you will be starting at level 20. Uh, you can race change uh, or boost the an allied race once you've unlocked them as well. If you do decide to level one from scratch from that level 20 mark, and you level all the way to 110, you will get a set of heritage armor to show off that achievement, uh, which can be mogged on your main character too. So that will be really awesome. Uh, and there's six allied races obviously planned for at launch, three for each side, and more planned. So I don't know what else we might be seeing, but they have said that this is certainly something they want to expand upon. So Alliance are going to be getting Void Elves, uh, Lightforge Drenai, and Dark Iron Dwarves. Now I'm especially excited here about the Void Elves. Uh, what do we know about these at the moment? Realistically, we know fuck all. We've only seen little bits. We do have a little bit of info about the Lightforge Space Goats though. Uh, so the Lightforge Drenai are going to have the same all features in regards to customization, but they'll have tattoo style and runes uh, and some new facial hair apparently. In the demo at the moment, this may very well change, but class-wise, they only have access to Warrior, Paladin, Hunter, Priest, and Mage. Uh, Racials-wise, they have Light's Judgment, which is calls down holy damage uh, to all enemies within five yards after three seconds. It has a 40-yard range and a 2.5-minute cooldown at the moment. Force of Light summons a Forge of Light, enabling blacksmithing. They also have a blacksmithing skill increase of 10. Demon Bane, experience gain from killing beasts increased by 20%. Uh, holy Resistance, they reduce holy damage taken by 1%. And Final Verdict, when you die, the light avenges you, dealing holy damage to enemies within 8 yards and healing allies. So that's pretty much all we know uh, around the racials at the moment for the majority of the allied races. We do know that Void Elves will go into Void form for combat, and then they'll have another form for other times, much like Worgen's. Uh, for the Horde side of things, the Horde side for the three allied races are getting Zandalari Trolls, the Nightborn, and the High Mountain Torrens. Uh, again, we don't have a hell of a lot of information around this. We do know that they're going to let Zandalari Trolls be Druids, and their travel form will be a Raptor, so that is awesome. Uh, in regards to the High Mountain Torrens, we do have a little bit of information about their racials. So High Mountain Torrens, Rugged Tenacity reduces damage taken. Pride of the Iron Horn, uh, which is a mining skill, increased by 15 and allows you to mine faster. Mountaineer increases your versatility by 1%. Bull Rush, charge forward for one second, knocking enemies down for one and a half seconds on a two minute cooldown. And waste not, want not, you have a chance to loot additional meat and fish. So that's what we know uh, around the allied races. We will be getting six extra character slots per account for these as well. So that is really fucking cool. So other things you will see in the new expansion. Uh, we're gonna be getting another stat and item level squish to bring everything back down to line. And that's not really a bad thing either. Uh, raid buffs are coming back. So remember the long before time when you would all be standing before the boss and you would be dishing out all the raid buffs. Well, Blizzard thought that that was a really cool thing and they wanted to see it come back. They thought raid buffs made classes feel special and unique. They don't want them to be overpowered or extreme, but they just want to bring back that buff the raid before the boss kind of feels. Titan forging is here to stay. However, armor that uh, interacts with the amulet, the heart of Azeroth, will not be able to Titan forge. So I guess that's something. Um, again, the Titan forge system or the war forge system has been a really interesting one. It's either been really happy or it's been really fucking tilting. Um, there is more customization set to hit character creation, so wargons and goblins will be getting new models. It will not be uh, straight off the bat though. There's also going to be upright orcs coming soon as well. The team is looking into time walking plus, so they're looking at making keystones for time walking dungeons to expand that mythic plus feel to older dungeons. 
Uh, flying is going to be unlocked in a similar format we saw in Legion, which is fine. I've got no issues with that. The legendary system is gone. The traits from the amulet are replacing that, and I think that's a good thing. Six new character slots, as I said, per realm will be made available with the allied races coming in. Uh, and we're looking into cross-realm trading, which again would be good as well, but they just have to make sure it doesn't have an adverse effect on the economy. Um, so that's it for the new expansion. I did speak a little bit about 7.3.5 in my intro as well. 7.3.5, we're going to see some of those leveling changes come in. We're also going to see the Oldowa time walking raid, and we're going to see the new battleground, which is coming in too, which is the seething shore. So there's a few things planned for 7.3.5 in regards to quality of life with leveling and things like that, that should look really well, uh, really good as well. So the last thing I want to talk about is, of course, the extremely loaded WoW Classic announcement. And it is as divided as the Alliance and the Horde with people on both sides who are super passionate about this. I don't know how I feel about this. That is absolutely honest. I have no idea how I actually feel about this. Um, I don't know if I want to go back and play classic or not. And don't get me wrong, no one's forcing me to. That's the whole beauty of this. I'm a huge vanilla fanboy, okay? So I played from launch. All of my touchy wow special feels are attached to vanilla. So raiding with my guild, that 40 man guild feels, the Emerald Dream World bosses, Kazak, doing the AQ Scepter quest and having to do, you know, the Nightmares and the Twilight Grove and, and Moors and things like that. I was playing, I was at uni when I was playing vanilla and I would have been sinking easily, easily 80 hours a week into World of Warcraft. Um, I was working like a casual night job from 5 p.m. to midnight every now and again. I would occasionally go to uni and I would raid from about 8.30 in the morning till 4 p.m. with the US Guild all fucking day. And that was generally like, I think it was like four or five times a week we were raiding. Um, and that was my life. Like I, I lived and breathed World of Warcraft. Like I absolutely loved vanilla, but do I want to go back to it? If will, you know, if I go back to it, will that ruin those memories? Will it be like I remember? Do I want to go back to a game where half the specs that I enjoy now or the classes I play aren't viable or just aren't there? You know, do I want to go back to something that requires all that time to get something done? Do I have the time to do that now? And the answer is probably no, but I honestly don't know. And that, again, is just me. Um, I've already seen posts on the floor, uh, forums for a call to bloodlust and heroism to be included. Um, for the group finder to be in there, but that's not going to be vanilla wow, is it? You know, and that's already what we're seeing on forums. Do some of these people know what they're sort of going into. And I understand a lot of people understand fully what vanilla is and that's what they want. And, you know, I'm not arguing with that, but I think a lot of these other people have no idea and that's why they're asking for these quality of life bits to be put in, but that's not going to be the pure vanilla experience. Um, if you don't actually know much about vanilla, I'm kind of going to give you a rundown on what your pure vanilla experience is going to give you. It's going to mean that only warriors can be tanks. It's going to mean the rep paladins outside of a reckoning bomb bug are going to be rubbish. It means that shadow priests are shit. It means that bear tanks are rubbish. It means that if you want to play a priest on the alliance side, that you're playing a dwarf for fear ward. It means that if you go into AV, you're not leaving for a week's time. It means that you need to get around MP5. It means that everyone, uh, every weapon is now actually a hunter weapon. It means that basically you're not going to see any epics unless you raid with 40 people. There's a good chance that 30 of those people could be complete retards. There's a chance that you could get epics from the 20 man options ZG and AQ20 and they are epics but they're peasant epics and it means that you won't actually be able to afford a mount and you will be spending the majority of your time running everywhere. So that's like the, the pessimistic view of Vanilla Warcraft. And don't get me wrong, a lot of that stuff is what I actually loved about WoW uh, back in its vanilla days. But that's what some people are going into that I don't think they actually understand. In saying 
all of that though, let me give full credit to what Vanilla was about. Vanilla wasn't about all the quality of life that we have in retail now. It was about the experience. It was about the immersion in the server and the game. And I fully understand that. And in some aspects, I do miss those feels as well. There was nothing better than queuing into a Rathi Basin or Warsong Gulch um, or Ultrag Valley and knowing the horde that you were going up against, knowing the good players on the server when you were in Iron Forge and everyone was gathered around someone because they had Thunder Fury or Elementium Borwalk or the Wrath Helmet, things like that. That stuff bought really close server communities and I do get missing that. I do wonder how sustainable WoW Classic is going to be. Like, obviously, Blizzard are doing this because they feel they can generate income subscriptions off this. You know, they're not doing it because they think, uh, these legacy guys have been harping on for it long enough. Let's spend a bunch of money and just give back. They're doing it because they think they can make something. So how is this going to be bundled as well is going to be another thing. Is it going to be a bundled package with the new expansion battle for Azeroth if it's ready? Is it going to be a complete separate purchase, $60 or something like that, with an ongoing subscription fee to fund the resources they're allocating? Like, I don't know what they're going to do. And then how long does it last for? Will people then want new content created for vanilla once that time span is done? I don't know. It's... uh. It is going to be really interesting. And as I said, I didn't expect it to happen. So I am really, really surprised by that announcement. They did it in a really cool way. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's just going to be interesting. As for me, whether I will go back and play it, I don't know. I honestly don't know at the moment. If I do, I'll be going back and playing an arms warrior just for PVP uh, because warriors were so OP. But then again, if I don't have raid gear, then I'm fucked there anyway. I will wonder if we'll see some achievements uh, from WoW Classic feed into retail. Will we see uh, Battle.net in, uh, in there to be able to converse with people if you're playing Classic to retail? Um, you know, the only achievements that I'd really be interested in would be going back and sitting uh, in a BG for 60 hours a week, uh, if that was even possible for me to try and get like Grand Marshal or something like that. But, you know... It's it's just it's going to be really interesting to see how this pans out, and I am really interested to see how you guys feel about Classic WoW. Do you not care? Are you really excited? Are you looking forward to all these things? Um, is it going to bring people that you used to play with back to the game? How do you feel about the new expansion? All of that stuff, guys. I know it's been a, uh, a lengthy video, and hopefully I've done it in a format that you've enjoyed. Uh, and it's brought you up to speed with things if you if you sort of uh, hadn't been keeping up with it. But that's pretty much it for me, guys. Very interested to hear your opinions and thoughts. You may have a different viewpoint to me uh, that I haven't even thought of, and you may be able to shed some light on a few things for me. So thank you very much for taking the time to check out the video, guys. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. See you, guys.